Good afternoon. Anyashimika. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to thank. Uh, I, I want to start by thanking KDBA and KUSAF for inviting me to address this sixth alliance forum. And I also want to take special note to recognize the good work of General Jung and General Sharp in supporting the alliance. Uh, those two gentlemen and many of you in this room, you are critically important to the continuing strength of our alliance, and we are grateful for that. Um, there's a lot of distinguished visitors here who have already been recognized, so I want to acknowledge them and thank them for their continuing support to the ROC U.S. Alliance and all the flag officers, uh, National Assembly, the Defense Committee Chairman, just meeting him for the first time, and other National Assembly members, so thank you for joining us today. I am extremely proud to be the commander of United Nations Command, Combined Forces Command, and United States Forces Korea, and to serve in support of the ROC US Alliance. Forged in the crucible of combat, baptized by blood, our alliance was founded upon core values, shared sacrifice, and demonstrated commitments to each other. This was true 70 years ago, and it remains true today. It is the honor of my life to live and serve in the Republic of Korea. As many of you know, I had never served here until my arrival in November of 2018. And after 20 months of experiencing Korean culture, meeting and making new friends, many of them are in the room right now, Seeing the beautiful country and learning the rich 5,000 year history, my only regret is that I did not serve here earlier in my career. And I am fortunate to work with outstanding Republic of Korea military leaders who seek only the best for their nation and the alliance. As General Jung already mentioned, I am the fourth Abrams boy to serve here. Our commitment began with our father in 1953 who served as a Corps Chief of Staff prior to the armistice being signed and then he helped oversee the implementation. My oldest brother served as a second lieutenant fire support officer along the demilitarized zone in 1962. And my middle brother commanded the second infantry division from 1993 to 1995. And also, as General Jung mentioned, my father-in-law served here two tours in the late 60s and early 70s, and my brother-in-law served here in the early 1990s. So the Abrams family is all in. We're all in when it comes to the defense of Korea. Serving in a country with such an ancient history puts into perspective the challenges that we face and the opportunities we have. 2020 has been a whirlwind. In response to the global pandemic, the Republic of Korea implemented an aggressive and highly successful COVID response, demonstrating their global leadership and inspiring the world with a model to follow. With the Korean government in the lead, U.S. Forces Korea partnered closely with the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to effectively suppress the spread of COVID-19, which protected our force which protected our mission. U.S. Forces Korea has not had a positive case within our assigned forces on the peninsula since the 13th of April, 2020. Our aggressive and thorough reception, testing, and quarantine program for new arrivals has proven highly successful in identifying positive cases from our newly assigned personnel. I want to thank the Korean government for donating 500,000 masks to Korean war veterans, demonstrating the ongoing commitment our two nations have for each other. Further, the U.S. Forces Korea community is grateful to the Korean government for sharing their robust testing capability and sharing lessons learned for sanitation and case tracking, tracing. The close partnership with KCDC has successfully enabled USFK to protect our force, our community, and our mission. 
Last month, we arrived at a short-term measure to the LAP Special Measures Agreement, which allowed our furloughed Korean national employees to return to work just a couple of weeks ago. This enhanced our ability to ensure we are maintaining a high level of readiness that we are known for. And we recently conducted important joint and combined leader development training, which served to strengthen our combined understanding of how we fight and demonstrated the real strength of our military-to-military -military relationship. We are extremely grateful for these opportunities and for our continued long-term relationship, which has a foundation that is built on mutual trust. This ironclad relationship is what gives us the confidence that we can confront any challenge together and overcome it. Differing views between our nations is nothing new. We have had differing views on occasion over 70 years. But like the idiom, Ubo Man Li, we have always overcome the problems confronting us by maintaining the course one step at a time during the thousand mile journey of our ironclad alliance. We have always overcome the problems confronting us together. Doing so always serves to strengthen our combined defense posture and will continue to strengthen the ROC US alliance in defense of the Republic of Korea and democracy. We know that the freedom of speech, the freedom to assemble, a robust justice system, self-determination, all of these attributes of thriving democracies support our common goal, lasting peace and security across the Korean Peninsula. The security landscape is constantly evolving, and it demands our two countries' militaries to be cohesive, ready, and prepared to defeat any adversary if required. Now, one topic I know that's on many people's minds is the conditions-based OPCON transition plan. So let me be very clear up front. The United States is firmly committed to the successful execution of this alliance plan that will ultimately result in a Republic of Korea four-star leading Combined Forces Command and our combined defense of the Republic of Korea. Now, the history of our combined forces is really important to understand when we talk about OPCON transition. When the ROC US Alliance established Combined Forces Command as the Operational Warfighting Command in Korea in 1978, the defense mission of the Republic of Korea was transferred from United Nations Command to Combined Forces Command. Combined Forces Command is a separate military entity that receives its policy, direction, and guidance from a binational command structure. And that starts with the Combined Military Committee. And the Military Committee receives its direction from the Security Consultative Body, headed by the U.S. Secretary of Defense, the ROC Minister of Defense, and the two National Command Authorities. Combined Forces Command is unique. It is a one-of-a-kind in many ways. The underlying first principle is that every major decision is binationally approved and agreed to as an alliance. During the Korean War, President Rhee granted General MacArthur and United Nations Command control of Korean forces. And that was in place until it evolved in 1994 when the ROC JCS assumed armistice OPCON of Republic of Korea forces. In 2006, 14 years ago, the Alliance agreed to a tentative OPCON transition date between 2009 and 2012. In February of 2007, the Republic of Korea and U.S. agreed to transition that wartime OPCON to a Republic of Korea only warfighting headquarters and to have that completed by April 
2012. And then in 2008, the Alliance developed a parallel command structure with U.S. Forces Korea transitioning into U.S. Korea Command, or CORCOM. And CORCOM was to provide those specific U.S. capabilities in support of that Korean warfighting headquarters. Now, following North Korean provocations in 2010, including the artillery bombardment of Yongpyongdo Island and the sinking of the Chonan, the U United States agreed to the Republic of Korea request to delay OPCON transition until December 2015. In 2013, the military committee meeting endorsed a future command structure concept, so another change, to a combined future command that would replace the separate ROC-only warfighting command and U.S. CORCOM. And that was subsequently approved at the 45th Security Consultative Meeting. In October of 2014, the Alliance determined that a time-based plan was no longer appropriate. And together, together the Alliance developed a conditions-based plan that was signed at the 47th Security Consultative Meeting in November 2015. And that brings us to where we are today. The conditions-based plan has three overarching conditions to be met. First, the Republic of Korea must obtain the military capabilities required to lead the combined defense. This condition includes 26 critical military capabilities. Second condition, there must exist comprehensive alliance response capabilities against North Korean nuclear missile threats, which includes the Republic of Korea acquisition of strategic strike and Korean air and missile defense capabilities. And lastly, the third condition, the security environment on the Korean Peninsula and in the region must be conducive to a stable transition of wartime operational control. To expeditiously proceed with OPCON transition, the Korean government boosted defense spending. Since 2017, the Korean government has consistently increased defense spending between 4 to 8 percent per year. Notably, the 7 percent increase in 2018 was the Korean government's biggest single-year jump since 2009, almost a decade ago. The Korean government sustained this trend in 2019 and 20, with increased spending of 8.2 percent and 7.4 percent respectively. From 2017 to 2020, the Korean government went from the 10th to the ninth largest defense budget in the world. An extraordinary feat in such a short amount of time. Continued commitment by the Korean government and the National Assembly to provide consistent funding towards the acquisition and development of the critical military capabilities that are included in this plan is critically important to fully meeting the conditions that the Alliance agreed to. Now, there are some people who do not completely understand what upcoming transition means. And here's what I tell them. The true strength of our military alliance is that our alliance is built on mutual trust and consultation. The combined governance decision-making system that is in place now for Combined Forces Command will continue to exist into the future. Our balanced and binational decision-making process, along with the guidance and direction from the Combined Military Committee, will remain as long as there is a combined, or a combined Forces Command. This is the beauty of our unique system. This structure supports and reinforces the true strength of our unbreakable, earthquake-proof, COVID-19-proof, Rock U.S. Alliance. Since the creation of Combined Forces Command, the core concept, inherent in its very nature, has always been the balance between our two nations. Significant progress on OPCON transition has been made. 
In 2019, the Alliance made more progress in evaluating up-kind transition requirements than the previous three years combined. Further, our Alliance reached by national concurrence on the draft strategic documents, which defines the relationships between all the commands in Korea, a significant milestone in UPCON transition. But we still have a ways to go to fully meet the conditions our two countries agreed to. I am supremely confident that the Republic of Korea is working diligently to meet the conditions, and our combined defense posture will be strengthened along the way. Because we all know a ready and postured combined force is crucial to the defense of the Republic of Korea. And as such, training and readiness of our forces is the single best guarantee for stability and security on the peninsula. We have seen what has happened when we have been underprepared and ill-equipped. General Jones mentioned it. We can never have another Task Force Smith. Following the North Korean invasion on June 25, 1950, South Korean American forces found themselves outnumbered and outgunned in high-intensity combat. And that U.S. Task Force Smith of the 24th Infantry Division answered the call in defense of Korea, but they had not routinely conducted rigorous training to standard because they were serving an occupation duty in post-war Japan. Additionally, Task Force Smith was not properly equipped to fight Soviet-made T-34 tanks. Their artillery, their cordless rifles, and small 2.36-inch bazookas merely bounced off the T-34's armor. The strongest part of the North Korean Army simply rode over and through the brave, tiny American force. And that was 70 years ago to this coming weekend. Outnumbered, outgunned, and ill-prepared, Task Force Smith was not ready to fight tonight. We cannot forget the lessons that they learned. and We must ensure it never happens again. And as such, we must remain a trained, ready, and disciplined force that is properly equipped. This means tough, realistic training during the day and at night, on the ground and in the air. And like the ancient proverb, Chim Guada De Don, which means sleeping with a spear underneath your pillow, we must always be ready to fight tonight. Now, as many of you know, unfortunately, we had to postpone our theater-level combined command post training event earlier this year due to the ongoing global pandemic. While we have been able to conduct important leader development training, that in no way replicates the rigor and realism of our semi-annual theater-level training events. Those theater-level training events are essential to our readiness. And to achieve our combined readiness objectives, there are a couple of additional points I want to emphasize. First, we must continue to conduct combined arms live fire training. It must include armor and infantry, along with mortars, artillery, helicopters, and close air support. It must be realistic with rigorous scenarios that constantly evolve that forces our troops to deal with the unexpected. Combined arms live fire exercises are the gold standard for preparing the force for any potential conflict and for building confidence in our formations, our teams, and our leaders. Second, critical fight tonight air component capabilities across the services must continue to have access to training ranges. When we do not have access, we have had to send some of these air capabilities off the Korean Peninsula so they can train appropriately. That, when that happens, it reduces our forces on the pen to respond to a potential crisis. The recent closure of ranges, insufficient access due to civilian protests, and challenges with scheduling and airspace allocation comes at a great cost to our readiness. These barriers to combined live fire training are consuming our readiness, not building it. I fully understand 
and appreciate the domestic challenges and burden on the Korean people when it comes to our combined training. But with active leadership and engagement by civilian and military leaders from both countries and support from the National Assembly Defense Committee, I am certain we can find solutions that meets everyone's needs so that we can remain ready to defend the Republic of Korea and its people. Lastly, we should never confuse enthusiasm with capability. We can have all the best technology and equipment in the world, but if our force is not trained and ready to use that equipment, we are not fully capable, nor are we ready. Our people are our most precious resource, and we owe them the best training possible to give them the skills and confidence to fight and win in any condition. Ultimately, we should strive to remove any obstacles that degrade our fight tonight readiness and ability to defend the Republic of Korea and the Korean people. Training is even more important as we face an increasingly dynamic operational environment on the Korean Peninsula where the threats continue to evolve. And as we have seen, the recent period of reduced tension has given way to new tensions. And the detente we experienced in 2018 has changed somewhat into a period of missile tests and increasingly hostile rhetoric. While we continue to act in support of diplomacy, we also continue to observe activity in North Korea that is inconsistent with denuclearization. We must remain ready to defend our two nations if called upon. Our strong combined defense posture remains the single most credible deterrent to North Korean aggression and allows our diplomats to negotiate from a position of strength in support of a more permanent peace across the peninsula. Despite these current challenges, the Republic of Korea-U.S. alliance remains the linchpin of security and stability in the region. And it is ready to fight tonight, if called upon. We have stood shoulder to shoulder for 70 years, and we remain the most capable, ready, combined and joint warfighting force in the world. Our slogan is Kachi Kachi Da. We go together. This is not just a bumper sticker or a hashtag. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, that we cannot accomplish together. Thank you again for having me here today. Come sum me down. Yeah. <laughs>